Every year, armies of highly educated college graduates join the ranks of investment banks and consulting firms, hoping to live the lifestyle they have been promised by media and their college peers. Boston Consulting Group has been recruiting at a breakneck pace and will bring in more people this year than ever. The consulting firms need a lot of new employees. BCG is planning 800 new hires for 2021. McKinsey wants to recruit 900 new employees. The top industries that hired MIT Sloan grads in 2021 were consulting, technology, and financed. I know three types of people going into careers at consulting firms and banks. The first type know that they don't want to stay in consulting or banking. They would never start their own company. So after staying in consulting and banking for two to three years, ultimately they might end up in private equity, venture capital, tech, industry and so on. The second type don't want to stay in consulting or banking either. The difference is that they want to start a company at some point. They might not know what or how, but their dream would be to be their own boss at some point. The third type are people who want to stay in consulting or banking forever. If you are type 1 or type 2, this video is for you. And I will show you with real life examples what will happen to your career in a worst case scenario. If you want to build a long term career in consulting or banking, so you're type 3, I respect your deep passion for these professions. Nevertheless, I'd ask you to reevaluate the ROI of your chosen career path when you have a quiet moment. Because we know even though money is not everything in life, it's almost everything. What is more important, more impactful, money or power? They go hand in hand. In the next minutes, I want to show you why picking consulting or banking as a first job might be a horrible trap, what you might end up like and what to do instead. For all of you type 1 and type 2ers, here is what you think your life will be like. I wake up euphoric. As I go through my morning routine, I ponder upon what an amazing decision it was to embark on this career journey. On the way to the office, I grab a cappuccino and accidentally bump into a beautiful lady. She stands in awe as she can't help but notice my prestigious gravitas. She hands me her number. What follows is a day full of interesting challenges, thought-provoking discussions and life-enriching connections. I wake up wasted. No wonder I have slept two hours less than my biological minimum. As I hurry up to get dressed, my manager calls me to brief me on today's to-dos, all of which sound like they could be easily executed by a monkey. I consider quitting but remind myself that my bonus is going to be paid out in two months and I really need to finance my prime location apartment rent somehow. When was the last time I got to see my apartment during daylight, by the way? Anyways, let's spread some comps. Life in consulting or banking is tough. You work more than 60 hours per week, according to most major sources and my own experience. But it's also tough to quit. Banks offer empathy, better benefits and higher compensation to recruit and retain workers. Empathy. <laughs> Over the years, consulting firms and banks have refined their strategies for employee retention with tight promotion cycles, bonuses that incentivize employees to just stay one more year and non-monetary incentives like leasing cars that get unlocked at certain seniority levels. But don't let that lure you in. By working 60 to 80 hours per week, you have high opportunity cost. For example, because it's more difficult to build a side venture. Even though this is an essential ingredient on your path to financial freedom, as explained in my video, The Boring Path to $1 million Net Worth Before 35. However, the biggest risk you are taking is a different one. It's not living up to your potential. An average career. There are people yes. who should go out into the rice fields and pick rice. Yeah. And then there's another group of people who are samurai yeah. and who wield a sword and who take on missions that are dangerous. I want to give you some real life examples of rice pickers who started in consulting or banking, but first, let me make my point. As someone coaching students occasionally on how to enter consulting, I cannot recount how many times I have heard, I'll do two to three years in consulting and then I'll start a company. Or I'll work in banking for two to three years and then I'll become a VC or PE guy. First, let's look at people that want to start a company at some point. 
be their own boss. What should they do instead of consulting or banking? Then let's look at people that want to work in PE, VC, hedge funds, asset management and so on or do an MBA or anything else and what might be the best strategy for them. You have these articles like this one describing 10 famous CEOs that started in consulting. Notice anything? You probably haven't heard about half of these famous CEOs. On the other hand, have you heard about Elon Musk or Peter one, Thiel? One kind of perspective for a lot of the world-class entrepreneurs is they're not specialists. They're, they're something close to polymaths. Why is that, why, 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 do you, why is that a problem in the C-suite? I think there might be too many MBAs uh, running companies. And private equity investors and management consultants don't start new businesses. They squeeze extra efficiency from one ones with incessant procedural optimizations. It's no surprise that these fields all attract disproportionate numbers of high achieving Ivy League optionality chasers. So essentially they're saying there are too many generalists, too many IB guys, too many consultants, MBA guys trying to form companies unsuccessfully. Nevertheless, it seems like there's almost an artificial narrative that consultants make incredible founders. I wonder who the people perpetuating this narrative are. All right, of course. Now, not because I want to diss this particular guy, but because it's a funny exercise to conduct. Let me react to all points why consultants are supposedly great founders and give my spontaneous counter reactions. The development of cross-industry know-how. This is exactly what Peter Thiel talked about. In consulting or banking, there's the danger to become a generalist, master of nothing. What you really want to become is a polyglot, properly mastering as many verticals as possible. Consultants develop a nose for what works and what does not work. I don't even know what the hell that's supposed to mean. Consultants are high performers. True, most consultants are high performers. But if you're not a high performer, consulting would not magically turn you into one. You either develop a hustle mentality by doing what you're passionate about or you don't. Consulting has nothing to do with that. Consultants have a good network. True, but they tend to know investment bankers, PE guys and Fortune 500 executives, none of which could give less fucks about startups and entrepreneurship. Consultants are all-rounders, but at the same time they must always develop themselves further. This is the same point you made in one. Not me see at all, my friend. Consultants can do sales and storytelling, aka pitching. Not a single consultant can do sales, especially not the kind of sales you need to be able to do for building successful B2B startups. Uh, for example, in the SaaS industry. If you want to learn sales, do sales, not consulting. Consultants are team players. Consulting and banking are very hierarchical environments. Hence, consultants and bankers are good at taking orders. If you want to become a good team player, start working in a low hierarchy environment, like in a startup. Next, let's look at people who want to work in other industries after a short stint in consulting or banking. For some career goals, it really does make sense to work in consulting or banking before. In general, there are roughly seven different exit options after consulting or banking. Private equity, venture capital, hedge funds, other finance jobs, asset management, financial advisory, and so on. Non-finance jobs, for example, tech or industry, founding something, or going back to university for your MBA. Five out of these options are perfectly available if you do not work as a consultant or banker first. The two that are not are private equity or hedge funds. But also here, according to MNI, funds are starting to hire fresh out of undergrads. Want to work in venture capital? Start a business and get funding then switch sides. Want to work in tech? Grab some technical certificates and work your way up. I guess the point we're trying to make in this video is this. Look at all these people. They chased consulting and banking brand names on their CV. Worked long hours, probably never had time to build something on the side. Did they ever ask themselves what they are really passionate about? How they want to change the world? For most of them, I doubt it. And where did this strategy get them? Right in the center of the normal distribution. F 
average. And that's okay. Not everybody needs to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or the next Henry Kravis PE tycoon. But if you do want to have a shot at that, you need to plan and walk your very own individual path without automatically going for banking or consulting just because everybody seemingly does so. And if you don't strive for all that money and power, Some weeks ago, I had a conversation with a friend who just quit his job at a major global consulting company brand name. He said that, looking around, around 90% of his colleagues seem to be unhappy with what they are doing. He didn't want to end up like this, so he made the decision to leave and follow his passion, something he wanted to do since his school years. He is going to become a teacher. And as much as I would like him to strive to become a billionaire and amass massive amounts of power, this is the type of decision-making this world needs more of. 